And as our weekly tradition here on Capital Outlook, we have another Capital Outlook profile with Senator Kale Case for Lander. Senator, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. You've been serving in the legislature a long time, first in the House, now in the Senate. You're approaching the 30-year mark. You were born and raised in Lander. Yes. Give me a, an idea of what, who Kale Case was in junior high and high school. Wow. So you got to think about Lander back then. That was a, uh, We were a mining town, U.S. Steel. Uh, all the U.S. Steel kids were my friends. They were all big families. Lander had about as many people then as it does now, but had a lot fewer houses because they were all full of people. My dad had a pharmacy in town. He was the Democratic County Chairman. People don't know that. Um, my grandfather that lived here in this house, lived in that room there, he was a, just a right-wing Republican. And he and my father Some good were, family debates. Yeah, there was yeah. lots of those. Uh, my brother was in the Vietnam War. He was wounded in the Vietnam War. I can remember that when I was a little kid. Um, Lander was a great place to grow up. As we, small towns all across the country are, you know, it's like it was like a Tom Sawyer kind of uh, uh, days. You could just take off and come home when the dinner bell rings. You remarked about U.S. Steel having a presence here. Huge. Um, and also, certainly with um, 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 the mine, you know, buses going to and from Atlantic yeah. City a union presence in Lander that probably yeah. isn't here today. Tell me what it was like in, in your memory from when all that, you know, when the mine closed. Well, I was working for the city when the mine closed. I was actually the staff economist. I was putting myself through graduate school by working a lot of projects for the city of Lander. So I had actually written an economic analysis, what would happen if the mine closed. Ooh. And I finished it um, the year before the mine closed. So it was a tool that we had as the city to understand how really huge that would be. You have to remember there were over 500 uh, primary breadwinners that lived up there uh, or worked up there. It was um, obviously mostly male in those days, but they brought home big money. That's a lot of people in a town of uh, 7,000 people. So you can imagine how that hit. I can remember when it really was uh, kicking in and people were moving and houses were for sale. You could literally look down any long street and you would see more than a dozen for sale signs, just as far as your eye could see down the streets. And that was uh, astounding. That was unnerving. Fast forward to Lander today. Ah, Lander today. Um, it's a very different town. It's, uh, it's a very progressive community. I, I like that a lot. And uh, it's got a lot of young blood. It's a vigorous community. But it's, uh, it's, it's more outdoor orientated, probably than any community in Wyoming, except for Jackson, I suppose, maybe. Uh, and the influence of the National Outdoor Leadership School. Huge, but mm -hmm. lots of other great organizations, mm -hmm. too, like the Nature Conservancy, Trout Unlimited, uh, um, the Wyoming Outdoor Council, uh, you know, either Wyoming Catholic College is here now, and they have a big outdoor component. So um, there's a lot of things that fit in to people really enjoying. Does Lander want to grow in Fremont County? Ah, well, does Lander want to grow? I think so. I think people would really like their children to be able to come back to Lander, but um, they kind of want growth on their own terms, which isn't a bad thing, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, we're just kind of sorting ourselves out. Small towns are struggling all over, and Lander has its own struggles. You know, uh, with the demise of Main Street and not being able to buy things locally, and and that's why I think shop local is such an important thing. It puts money in people's pockets that are in your community. But those are struggles that Lander has as well as, as anybody else. I think we've perhaps done a better job in some areas, but there's a lot more to, uh, challenges. Now, you talk about Lander's Main Street, and everyone thinks of Lander on the 4th of July. <laughs> this place is, for those who don't know, is unlike any other. <laughs> it is true. Uh, on the 4th. Describe for our viewers, you know, what, what Lander is. Oh, I, you know, I, uh, people never believe you because people always think they have great 4th of July's or so-and-so put on great 4th of July. In Lander, everybody has a professional show. Every, everybody... <laughs> The, the amount of money that goes into fireworks uh, on the 4th of July in Lander is astounding. And you can go to a high spot and look down at the town and you see professional quality shows throughout the town at the same time. Not dozens, hundreds or more. 
the, the goes the, on. Uh, it's very heavy duty. The sound here on the 4th of July is outstanding. And and the parade is great. Lander has a great tradition for its Pioneer Days parade. It's We really do embrace <clears throat> Pioneer Days. Turn the page just, to, just a moment. You've um, um, served for, for a long time and been a great advocate on the um, Select Tribal Relations Committee. Right. Does Wyoming get it right in the way it works with the tribes? We never get it perfectly right, but we do very well and we do better than any other state um it's astounding the sharing that we have what what folks don't realize is that wyoming taxes tribal minerals people didn't understand that we put a severance tax and uh, uh on the minerals that are produced uh, on from tribal lands and so for a long time, that was a little bit of a one-way street where money was going from the Wind River Reservation into Cheyenne and, again, out in Wyoming. But mm -hmm. I've been working very hard to change that. And we have, we have had some astounding successes. For example, tribal governments now can qualify for, for water development projects. And, in fact, we've had several. We've, um, between the transportation, the education, you know, I think we've finally turned the corner and are getting tribal uh, citizens the services they deserve from the state. There's always been this push-pull with the tribal liaisons, mm -hmm. at least in the last decade, with, um, with, with state government, with the executive, mm -hmm. and with, with the tribes. Why is that? Oh, I, I, to tell you the truth, I think uh, most of it is that folks in Cheyenne don't understand how complicated the relationship with tribal governments are. And we're the only state in that has a reservation like this, and it's the only reservation in the country that is jointly governed by two sovereign tribes. You know that doesn't happen anywhere else. Uh, you hear about Hopi and Navajo, but they have separate jurisdictions and territories. This is common. It makes it very difficult for the tribal governments to to function. But add to that working with the state government. And you can see how complicated it can be. So we have, take family services and social services. You have a state role and you've got a, a role from each tribal government. As well as the federal government. As well as the federal government. So it's everything is a challenge. It takes a little bit more coordination, but we're doing a good job. And, and, and astoundingly, there are higher levels of state-provided services on this reservation than anywhere else. And I, I mean that very definitively. In a lot of reservations, the state doesn't actually provide even the school systems. And to get assistance for municipal-type functions like water systems, and, and uh, we've even done a better job in transportation. The Department of Health gets tons of kudos lately for the work that's happened there and uh, um, a, a lot of work to the tr members of the Tribal Relations Committee that have helped to make this happen. Now, you yeah, add the tribal liaison position, on top of that, it gets a little bit more complicated, and we've had a hard time trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. um, I would say more in the past years that the Tribal Relations Committee has actually become sort of the tribal liaisons. And that's not the best way because, you know, there are probably 30 intersecting programs between tribal governments and state governments, and they all need coordination. They all need help, and the Tribal Relations Committee only meets for uh, about three days a year, so it's not enough time. You've been an advocate for the Life Resource Center, yes. formerly called the Wyoming State Training School. Mm -hmm. A lot of changes are happening there. You and I were reflecting back when I was involved with the training school, 700 yeah. and some clients, 700 and some employees. And it's very different today. You it have is. volunteered there. You've worked hard as a legislator there. What do you see its importance and its, its relevance here in Lander? Why, why should we continue to invest in it? Well, it's an astounding place. It is. And it's a place where miracles happen. <clears throat> um, I'm intimately connected with the Wyoming Life Resource Center. I'm, I've been the guardian for a decade now of a man um, who is one of the most profoundly um, impacted persons in Wyoming. And so I'm very... And when you say impacted, to be frank, probably, and I don't know, but severe physical challenges, severe mental challenges... Um, All of that, yeah. yeah. A very wonderful, uh, caring person who, uh, uh, he's, I just can't, he's done so much for me to be uh, this person's guardian. But 
there is no other place for him, uh, uh, honestly. And there are quite a few folks just like that. So I think there's a future for that population, but that is only kind of a piece of what the Life Resource Center's mission is going to be. And, you know, it's been redefined that that very hard to place, um, uh, they, the Department of Health likes to call them the legacy population, which I don't really like that much, but there are folks that were left after all the people that could be moved out were moved out. And these are very uh, profoundly disabled individuals. And uh, uh, I should say people, first language, people with profound disabilities. That's mm -hmm. a better, more respectful way to say it. But our options aren't very good for those people. So that there'll be a future for them at the Life Resource Center, thankfully, and thank mm -hmm. the state of Wyoming for rising to that commitment. But that's only the beginning because of the uh, ability to um, have more of an intermediate and long-term presence for people with acquired brain injury, very hard to place people, di duly diagnosed people, people that uh, allow for maybe a better environment than they might currently receive with state facilities elsewhere. So I'm excited about, and the model that's being employed is called the greenhouse model. I don't know if you've heard about this, sure. but it's very uh, holistic, human-centric, uh, wonderful new way of providing elder care. Mm -hmm. and a Great example of that is in Sheridan for elder, um, elderly folks. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that'll be the new basis for operation of the Life Resource Center. <clears throat> but it actually... The, the facility was one of the first places to actually pioneer some early elements of the greenhouse model. And they, they do astounding work. I'll just give you one example. I knew a girl up there who's no longer uh, alive. She lived for 17 years on a ventilator. Mm -hmm. Now, listen, that's unheard of. Mm -hmm. And if you look at their other uh, elements of care, um, these people have to be repositioned uh, every two hours their entire life. They don't have skin problems at the Wyoming Life Resource Center because they are so good at protecting the integrity of care, getting all the therapies they need. It's the kind of care in a unified team approach that everybody wishes they had in America. So it's where we're doing the very best. And nationally surveyed, the very top. World surveyed, at the very top. So we can learn from what they're doing and uh, uh, benefit, who knows, veterans, benefit other folks with needs. I'm very, very excited about that. We'll hop to another subject. Okay. You're pretty hoppy. We are. We have lots to cover with you, Senator. That's okay. probably why. And here's an example. You were in Georgia recently, and I'm not talking about the right. state whose capital is Atlanta. You were, you were overseas working. What were you doing? So I was in the uh, former Soviet Republic of Georgia. It was my second trip this year to Georgia, and I was working for the United States. Uh, it's called USAID, Aid for International Development. Um, I've had lots of time over the, uh, lots of opportunities in the past, oh, 30, 40 years to travel to other countries and work on usually public utility issues. You know, from my background, I had been at the Illinois Commerce Commission. Most people don't know that, but that's a utility regulatory commission. And that's kind of where I picked up a lot of my work uh, within the electric utility mm -hmm. industry, kind of come back to the wind tax. Mm -hmm. But I also uh, was involved in the telecommunications reforms. And, and you still work with technology for Wyoming. I'll throw that in real quick. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I'm, I'm very proud of the work <clears throat> leading the tech committee, along with uh, Chairman Zawanasur from the House. And we've been involved in, you know, all the accessibility that you see on the website yep. for uh, for Wyoming legislature. I'm very proud of that. So anyway, it, uh, it, I do consulting work, and, and in, specifically in Georgia, I was working on the nation's water system, um, where they have a kind of overly centralized uh, model, and they're trying to break it down a little bit, and the question is how to do that. And you have to imagine it's about the size of Wyoming, and all the little water companies and all the little towns are run from the capital, which would be like running all the running Hudson and Shoshone's water company from Cheyenne. And it doesn't work very well, but it's a legacy of um, a Soviet S system. Centralistic yeah. government, so to speak. Here. But um, <clears throat> we're making progress there. I really enjoyed it. I've worked on electricity issues in a lot of different countries, um, customer service issues, energy, telecommunications. I've been very fortunate. Senator, for those of us who um, have the great pleasure of coming to work in the Capitol during the session or the temporary Capitol, the wow. day the baseball glove appears on your desk is a great day in my eyes because yeah. two things. 
One, the legislative session is, is nearing its end. We're getting right on spring training, right? And spring training started. What, why, um, how did that start? You know, uh, I've got a great love for baseball. And uh, I think it probably started mostly. And tell everyone who you're a fan of. You're well, a, I'm a Cubs fan. Sure you're, I, I spent some time in Illinois and in and Chicago. And this is a Cardinals fan here. Yeah, so. we do have a little <laughs> friction. But Springfield was like where I lived in Illinois was like half and half. You know, there were bars that were Cardinals. Cardinals but, but still are today. Yeah. Actually, yep. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm really excited that with uh, baseball these days. Although uh, I, I kind of follow George Will, you know, and how we need to maybe speed up a little bit. But. In Wyoming, uh, we used to play baseball at the university level. Sure. Um, and it, Greg Brock. I mean, yeah. Bill Ewing. Oh, uh, you Jones got it. Absolutely. It was tough to do baseball in Wyoming. But when the university decided to cut down on its number of sports and baseball went by the wayside, some of us tried to encourage them to get it back. And we had we would have bills or amendments trying to get baseball. And then we started celebrating uh, uh, spring training. It's kind of... Everybody's watching it anyway. Why not bring a little bit of fun into the capital? So I'm not alone on that. Uh, there's been several of us over the years that break out the gloves. We're going to miss John Hastert. He always had his glove. And Michael Von Flater, he'll have his glove. And we now, miss Tony Ross. He always had a glove. Not only, Senator, are there gloves, there's the ball every now and then. The ball does come out, and uh, we see if we have arms and uh Jane Mockler, when she, we used to serve with her, she'd hold her breath about the artwork. And we've gone to a Nerf ball actually the past year or so. But <laughs> what? I think well, we're that's not. That's no fun. <laughs> I know we're not as good as we used to be, but we don't practice enough. Well, but so, it, sometimes the balls get going pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's been great to watch you. Um, I've had the luxury, Senator, of living in Fremont County for a long time before we moved to, to Cheyenne, and and have known you for a long period of time. You enjoy what you do. I love it. It seems to me. Yeah. Oh, it's been a very uh, wonderful opportunity for me to, uh, you know, I like the kind of every aspect of it. I like having to make thoughtful decisions. I like being able to help people. Um, I'm very grateful for my reelection and look forward to going down to Cheyenne. And then especially, you know, this wind tax issue, it's very prominent for me because it is about future generations and whether they'll have a revenue stream from uh, something that, that we're giving away too cheap right now. Well, it's a pleasure, Senator. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you in Cheyenne. Topic. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. This program is supported in part by a grant from the BNSF Railway Foundation, dedicated to improving the general welfare and quality of life in communities throughout the BNSF Railway Service Area. Proud to support Wyoming PBS. And in part by the Wyoming Public Television Endowment and viewers like you.